Explain arbitrage and the role it plays in determining prices and promoting market efficiency. Remember that by definition, the price of a derivative contract is based on the performance of its underlying. Now given that, by combining a derivative and the underlying into a single portfolio, you produce a perfect hedge with zero risk. It logically follows therefore that holding this risk-free portfolio should result in the investor earning exactly the risk-free rate over the life of the derivative contract. Now if more than the risk-free rate is earned by holding this portfolio, then an investor could go along the hedged position and borrow at the risk-free rate to earn a riskless profit. Now while such an opportunity exists, arbitrageurs will exploit it to the extent that the price of the derivative and the underlying will be forced back into equilibrium. The presence of arbitrage in the market has therefore moved the derivative's price. The concept of replication is closely related to that of arbitrage. When we looked at arbitrage we said that we can combine the derivative and the underlying to produce a perfect hedge and produce a risk-free return. Replication states that price equilibrium should hold for the alternative combinations also. For example, the derivative and a risk-free bond can be combined to produce the same return of the underlying. Or equivalently, the underlying and a risk-free bond can be combined to produce the return of the derivative. Given that arbitrage must not be present in the market, an asset and its replicable components must be priced the same. Now we move on to risk neutrality. Investors can be classed based on their level of risk aversion. Most investors are said to be risk averse, meaning that they expect a risk premium or an additional return above the level of risk they are taking on by entering into some particular position. The concept of replication and arbitrage presented previously ensure that risk-free positions should earn exactly the risk-free rate. The derivative price is based solely on the properties of the underlying, the derivative and this risk-free rate. The key thing here is that the investor's level of risk aversion has no impact. Given that risk aversion is not a factor in pricing the derivative, one can as easily assume that the risk investor is risk neutral. This means that the investor doesn't demand a risk premium. When derivatives are priced in this manner, it's called risk neutral pricing. This means that pricing models are simpler as they discount at exactly the risk free rate without the need to incorporate an additional risk premium. Combining arbitrage and risk neutrality when pricing derivatives is called arbitrage-free pricing or the principle of no arbitrage. It ensures that the price of a derivative is set in such a way that the market is free of arbitrage opportunities. Distinguish between value and price of forward and futures contracts. When we talk about price and value with futures and forward contracts, it's important to understand the terminology correctly. When I say price, I mean the contracted forward price, the price we have agreed to transact at in the future. When I talk about value, I mean the amount that either party stands to gain or lose if the contract expired right now. Quick example. Today the stock of company X is priced at 20 euro and the risk free rate in the market is 4%. Let's say we can enter into a forward contract and sell the stock at 20 euro and 80 cent one year from now. The present value of that future transaction is given by 20.80 divided by 1 plus 4%. That comes out to 20 euro exactly. So the value of going long the stock for 20 euro and short the forward which has a present value of 20 euro, means that there is no riskless arbitrage opportunity here. Let's say that three months later the stock price is 15 euro and we still hold the forward contract to sell at 20 euro and 80 cent. At this point now, the present value of the forward contract is 20.80 divided by the 1 plus 4 percent to the power of 3 over 4, which is 20 euro and 20 cent. So the portfolio is now worth the present value of the forward, 2020, minus the 15 euro it would cost me in the market to buy one share of stock which I'm expected to deliver against the forward. So now, 
the forward is worth five euro and 20 cent. In summary, the price is the cash side of impending forward transactions and value is the amount that each side of the forward would gain or lose right now if that contract were to expire. Explain how the value and price of a forward contract are determined at expiration, during the life of the contract, and at initiation. The wording of this LOS is somewhat confusing. You would be forgiven for assuming that we need to calculate a price and a value at each of the three stages, initiation, during, and expiration. What we are going to find through this video is that there is one forward price which is determined at the initiation of the contract. And from there, we have three values to calculate. Value at initiation, value at expiration, and the value during the life of the contract. Remember from earlier in this section that a forward contract has an initiation stage where the contract is agreed and the two parties are committed, and an expiration stage where the actual transaction takes place. When the contract is agreed, the parties will decide on a forward price. Now, this price, set out in the contract, is the price at which they will transact in the future, the price to be used on the expiration date. This is denoted F sub zero at time T. F for forward price, sub zero meaning it was set at initiation, time zero, and the capital T is the time it will be used, the expiration date of the contract. Now this is the first piece of the LOS, the forward price. This price is set in the contract and doesn't change over the term, so we now know what it is. How do we calculate it? The problem is that we are here, at the initiation of the contract. We have an uncertain future and no way to accurately predict the value of the underlying at the time of expiration. Let's start with the most basic case. Let's assume that the underlying asset of this forward pays no dividends or interest, it doesn't offer any non-financial benefit to the holder, and it has no carrying costs. Remember from earlier in this section that if we combine an underlying with a derivative contract, we have a perfect hedge. And with a perfect hedge, we will earn the risk-free rate. By that logic, we can infer that if we buy today for today's spot price, S0, we should be able to sell in the future for S0 times one plus the risk-free rate to the power of T. So the forward price, the price which we would contractually agree for F sub zero T, must be equal to spot price times one plus the risk-free rate to the power of T. Okay, so let's add some practicality to this thing. What about when the asset brings benefits or costs to the holder? For example, what if the holder of the asset earns a dividend, incurs a holding cost, receives an interest payment, or what about if the asset represents some kind of a convenience yield? Wait, what's a convenience yield? We'll look at all of these benefits and costs in detail in the next LOS. For now, just note that there are benefits and costs of actually holding the physical asset and that they must be factored into the price of a forward contract. Okay, so we have to account for these benefits accrued to or costs incurred by the holder of the underlying during the term. The ending value to them will now be the spot price increased by the risk-free rate minus the benefits they would receive from holding the underlying and plus the costs they would incur from holding the underlying. The idea is that transacting in the forward and just waiting for the expiration date should reflect the exact same value as transacting in the spot market and taking on all of the practicalities of holding the asset for the term. Starting with the basic relationship, we must remove the value of any benefits received and add in the value of any costs incurred. We end up with this equation here, which gives us the correct forward price from the spot price and the benefits and costs of carry. If you are wondering about the minus on the benefits and the plus on the costs, again, that's all going to be covered in the next LOS. We'll cover the individual benefits and the costs themselves and this minus on the benefits and the plus on the costs in the next section. Okay, so we have covered the price of the forward. Now we're going to look at the value of the forward at the three stages of its life, initiation, during, and expiration. 
The value of a forward is equal to the current spot price minus the present value of the forward price. First, let's look at the value of the forward at initiation. We start with the generic formula for value, spot minus present value of forward. For the value at initiation, we use the spot at time zero, denoted S sub zero. And we have the present value of the forward price discounted using the risk-free rate. But remember this equation from earlier in the video when we talked about the relationship between the forward price and the spot price at initiation. Plugging that into this equation, we end up with a value of zero. This is key. All forward contracts have zero value at initiation. No money is exchanged between two parties entering into a forward contract because on the initiation date, the contract represents no value to either party. It's a bet that during its life, the contract will come to some value. Next, let's look at the value of the contract at expiration. We start again with the general formula, spot minus present value of forward. Now we will be using the spot price on the expiration date, denoted S sub capital T. And the present value at time capital T of the forward price is just the full forward price. There's no discounting to be done. So this is the formula for calculating the value at expiry. Spot at expiry minus the forward price. Okay, finally here we need to look at the value of the forward contract during its life, denoted V sub little t. For this value, we use the spot at time little t, denoted s sub little t. And we need to discount the forward price back to time little t, which means dividing by 1 plus the risk-free rate to the power of big T minus little t. If you are confused about that power below the line, just realize that the discounting period is this area here, which is why we have a capital T minus little t in the formula. So to finish, here's a little summary, price and the three kinds of forward value. Describe monetary and non-monetary benefits and costs associated with holding the underlying asset and explain how they affect the value and price of a forward contract. In this section, we are going to quickly deal with some of the benefits and costs of holding assets and how these factors are accounted for in the pricing of a forward contract. When we consider that the price of a forward contract must completely reflect the risk of the underlying without actually being physically connected to the underlying, these benefits and costs must be accounted for. The amount that we are willing to buy for or sell at in the future must reflect them. Let's quickly step aside here and discuss this term convenience yield. A convenience yield is a non-financial benefit associated with holding an asset. An example would be the advantage to a retailer of having stock on hand. Although it costs them money to store it, there is a convenience to having stock available for sales, avoiding lost sales from a stock out. Okay, let's start by talking about the benefits to holding an asset. To account for any dividends, interest, or convenience yield, we take this basic relationship between the forward price and the spot price, and we remove the value of these benefits. Now, why remove? Remember that this principle of forward pricing works on the basis that we are aligning the forward price with a future value of the spot price. We are taking a transaction available in the spot market and using the time value of money to project a price for the future. When there is a benefit to holding the asset, we must remember that we don't get that benefit when we hold a forward contract. The benefit is reserved for those who agree to hold the asset. So if we're not getting it, we shouldn't have to pay for it, so we remove it from the price. Now when we move on to talk about the costs of holding an asset, this system still holds. We are trying to accurately depict the risk in the contract while accounting for things that only apply to holding the asset and are not relevant to a forward contract. When you hold an asset, there is going to be some cost to hold and store it. 
With the price of a forward contract, it is particularly simple to understand that a party who is long the forward must compensate the party who is holding the asset until the delivery date. We have contracted to buy something in the future and we must pay the party who is willing to hold on to it for us in the meantime. To that end, we must add the costs into the forward price. The forward price is going to increase by the amount extra we need to pay to cover asset storage over the life of the forward contract. Explain why forward and futures prices differ. There are a number of major differences between forwards and futures which we have discussed earlier in the derivatives material. For the purpose of this section though, the one you need to focus on is that futures are traded through a clearinghouse who will implement a daily mark to market. Remember that marking to market means that at the end of every trading day, a winner and a loser is decided and money changes hands. It is the responsibility of the loser in this scenario to top up their account with the clearinghouse if they want to continue this position. But the winning party now has some immediate return which they can go out and reinvest. This is the key distinction between futures and forwards. Winners have money to reinvest, losers need funding. This idea of one side having a return to lend out or reinvest while the other needs funding is not a feature of forward contract trading and throws up an interesting fact about futures. If prices are positively correlated with interest rates, a long party will prefer a futures contract. If prices and rates are negatively correlated, the long party will prefer a forward contract. Now when prices rise, the long party is winning and their returns can be reinvested at consistently higher rates. When prices fall, the long party is losing, but their losses can be funded at consistently lower rates.